Hello, evening, everyone. We're back for another round. Uh, with the next talk with William Gardner. Um, this time we're doing Take Back the Schools. Um, so I'll lead you back over to William. I'll pass you over to William now. Thanks very much. Here we go, William. Thank you for having me once again. Uh, uh, this is a kind of wrap up chapter on the three previous episodes we did on education, which were called Looking After Their Souls looking after their minds and looking after their bodies. And we saw how in all three of those areas, the schools, especially government schools or public schools, as we call them in North America, uh, have failed radically. So this chapter is about a uh, solution. Like what can be done about this situation? Um, let me say, first of all, not much. And if something only with great difficulty but some people have arrived at certain solutions in certain parts of the country. Of course, private schools have always been a solution, but not for people who couldn't afford them. And religious schools are a solution, too. And usually they're far, far less expensive than uh, either private schools or, if you want to know the truth, public schools. Uh, let me begin by saying the people have allowed the state to take out of their hands the most important task of any nation, which is the nurturing of the quality of the minds, spirits, and bodies of the young. And the state has done what any state would do. It has delivered a collectivist result. For example, runaway costs per student, an empire of academic bureaucrats, mediocre academic performance, a suppression of the core values of a free society and hordes of overweight, unfit children. In simpler terms, we now have unsound mind and spirits in unsound bodies. Well, it's time to admit they've had their day. They've tried it for over a hundred years and they have failed. So just as we gave the schools to the state, I think we ought to take them back from the state. Once people see that the surrender of the schools to the state was tantamount to a surrender of our future to the state, they will see that this unhappy situation must and can be reversed in several simple steps. There has, there has been a reaction, especially in America, uh, to the situation, and I preface the coming remarks by saying that there are probably no uh, public unions stronger than uh, teachers' unions uh, in America and Canada. Well, there's lots of other sort of unions too, but those those are huge and extremely powerful, and the most efforts to shape them or change their way of doing what they do have failed. But some have been successful, and I will lead up to those. Um, the most heartening recent event in the lamentable history of public schools in the West is the tacit agreement on a viable solution from two American think tanks that hardly ever agree on anything. The first is the Conservative Heritage Foundation and the left liberal Brookings Institution. They have reached uh, substantial independent agreement <clears throat> that public education, <clears throat> excuse me, is a dead letter and that more money, more bureaucracy and more legislation will not solve the problem of declining schools and standards. The bombshell news uh, came when John Chubb and Terry Moe of the Brookings Institute published their method methodologically very sound, thoughtful, and utterly conservative solution in a publication called Politics, Markets, and American Schools. Their analysis covered 500 schools and 20,000 principals, teachers, and students. It's already a classic of the inherently conflict conflicting consequences of trying to produce in a centrally planned way, something as personal, local, freedom-based, and family value-driven as education. What is unique about their book is that it advises everyone to give up 
on public education as, as, as we have known it and to design a new system based on, guess what? <laughs> based on parental choice. <laughs> now there's that word again. And it's interesting that no matter what the left is trying to do in any of, of the modern democracies, whether it be abortion on demand or euthanasia or free drug use or whatever, the operative word that always comes up is choice. Phrases like my body, my choice, you know, my choice in this, my choice of that. As if the human will was was the deciding factor on the good. Uh, if I will it and I choose it, therefore it must be good is the way the uh, thinking goes. Now we have uh, the idea of parental choice used by conservative researchers uh, act actually urging parents to get out of the grip of government education and choose different schools for their children. Their basic message is that regardless of the best intentions, handling education, handing education, or anything else for that matter, to the state in a democratic society will always result in an inverse relationship between cost and quality with the various manifestations of the state itself gradually cannibalizing the very resources meant to produce the product. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but every word of it, uh, I think, is true. Great conservative and classical thinkers from de Tocqueville to Hayek have warned of this outcome for generations. But what is new is the frank admission from uh, influential liberals themselves. Well, better late than never, I suppose. The result of this turf war over the schools is that parents and students simply don't get the schools they want. And that's because, as Chubb and Mo explain, the schools are not meant to be theirs to control and are literally not supposed to provide them <clears throat> with the kind of education they might want. That's point one. Point two is that because public schools have a coercive monopoly on tax-supported education, compared, say, with the private alternative for which tuition is paid in after-tax dollars, uh, they have the perceived and real advantage of being relatively inexpensive. I say relatively, because in truth, they're quite expensive. And they can attract and hold students without being particularly good at educating them. In fact, in rough numbers, Chubb and Mo calculate that U.S. public schools, and I'm sure this is a pattern repeated in all democracies, as a whole, cost about $5,000 per child per year, which is about double the $2,500 cost of private schools, most of which are very small and inexpensive, although we tend to hear only about the big expensive schools, which I, I said before, have really become like many universities and are incredibly expensive. They're kind of for the children of the elite, but there are lots of smaller, uh, usually religious schools around, <clears throat> which are not that expensive. At any rate, the public schools are governed by an enormous far-flung constituency in which the interests of parents and students carry no special status or weight. Uh, that comes from the study I've been quoting. The parents are just the breeding machines and the kids belong to the state. And I think in a prior lecture here, I mentioned this fellow named Alex Proudfoot in Alberta, Canada, who stood up in front at a parent teacher meeting and told every, all the parents that um, your children do not belong to you. They are like ga our gas and our oil. They belong to the state, <laughs> meaning he went on to say, that the, shape, the state will shape their minds and their souls <clears throat> as it wishes. So as I say, the parents are considered just the breeding machine in this scenario. Uh, such is the thinking, which is precisely opposite to that of private schools, of course, where the students and parents are the living center and far-flung so, uh, far flung society is quite incidental, even extreme, uh, ex extraneous. What all uh, previous so-called reformers in the U.S. and Canada have tried to do 
is to reverse this typical structural consequence of a public school system without eliminating the cause that produces the consequence, which is the role of the state itself. In other words, it's the very publicness of education that is the problem. Thus, the history of most school reform has been pretty pathetic. It's been one of trying to achieve this reversal uh, with various forms of evasive policy and always with more money. <clears throat> In both nations, by the way, I'm thinking of Canada and the U.S. now, it costs about 300% more to educate a student uh, this was in 1990 that it did in 1960, 30 years earlier. And of course, today we're 30 years on from that. It's even more expensive. I'm talking about constant dollars. Um, when we think of the radical nature of teachers' unions, you'll see that sizable, sizable radical elements in our society are un, have unencumbered and unwarranted control over a significant portion of the wealth of every, every homeowner in our so-called free society. In other words, the taxes are taken from you, whether you like it or not. And you may put your kids in a private school like I have done in Canada, but I still have to pay all the public school taxes. And there's no relief, in other words. But the ultimate tactic in government schools has been a variety of administrative obfuscation, such as talking about, quote, social promotion, unquote, or, quote, a gentleman's bee, unquote, uh, in grade inflation. Give them a bee because they're nice. The switch that came from John Dewey to, and we talked about this in a prior lecture, to child-centered teaching and the vigorous elimination of any standardized, standardized testing, thus allowing the teachers to escape from detection. You can't really talk about bad teaching if you can't measure the progress of the students in some kind of standard way. So what is needed, at any rate, I came to conclude, uh, is not conceptual reform, which we're always getting, but structural reform. We need to align the schools, not with the state, but with the family and the community as the key value-generating institutions of our society and in a way that transfers real power over the schools from the state to the parents. A public authority, in other words, must be put to use to create a system that is almost entirely beyond the reach of public authority. That's going to be a conundrum. But what Chubb and Mo offer is a powerful endorsement of the educational choice movement that has been sweeping North America they declare that reformers would do well to entertain, entertain the notion of choice as a panacea. They advocate removing the top-down, that's their phrase, top-down educational bureaucracy and restoring bottom-up control of the public schools so that families have a sense of owning the schools. <clears throat> Stated another way, what they advocate is replacing the public operating system of the schools with a system more akin to that of private schools. How are they going to do this? Well, there's a simple plan. Uh, and I think much of this was probably taken from Milton Friedman, who, who detailed the economic efficacy of this plan in a, an important book he wrote with his wife called Free to Choose. Uh, and of course, what we're after here in education is the freedom of parents to choose the schools they want for their kids instead of getting pushed around by the government and told where they're going to go, et cetera, and confining them in that way. So their simple plan, which at the time I said was easily transferable to Canada, was one, giving parents scholarships or vouchers. Now, what is a voucher? Well, a voucher would be equivalent to the per capita amount spent on each student from the state and provincial and local sources okay, perhaps income adjusted for those of low income, and so on. With such scholarships, parents are given the power to send their children to the school of their choice, anywhere, and can add to the amount if they want to send them to a more uh, expensive school. But the basic cost of schooling is covered by the voucher. You got five kids like I had, I have, you get five vouchers. 
You can spend at any school you want. Uh, the schools are restricted, but would have full autonomy in organization, budgeting, curriculum, and teacher hiring and firing. The government would have nothing to do with this. And new schools would be allowed to open in response to the new educational marketplace and the bad schools, simply because we're now talking about competition for the vouchers, um, would have to shut down. The state would be limited to teacher certification because no matter how good a voucher system is, you don't want uh, wonky schools starting up teaching magic to your kids and all kinds of other bizarre topics. So teacher certification, uh, the establishment of minimal graduation standards, and maybe the enforcement of health and safety standards too. It's interesting, when my wife and I moved to the area we're living in uh, presently, uh, we were out for a bicycle ride together and we came upon a, this was out of, in holiday time, we came across a public school uh, which was in an area where we wanted to move and buy a new home. So we said, let's go check out the school. So we rode our bikes over, put them against the wall and walked up to the door. The school was locked, but there was a sign on the door against the glass partition that said, warning, this school will not tolerate brass knuckles, knives or guns. <laughs> and so my wife said, I don't think this is the school for us. But I mentioned that by way of saying, we're at that stage where it's not seen as abnormal to put a sign like that up in some public schools in Canada. And by the way, I've never heard of this in any private or religious school. Police are hired to walk the hallways. In some schools, uh, not many, but in some, they have German Shepherd dogs with them. And they're sniffing at the kids' lockers looking for drugs. Uh, some of the teachers in some of these schools wear special buzzers on their belts. And if they're threatened with violence by a student, and it, believe it or not, but it is true, some of them get punched out by students. They push the buzzer and the authorities or the police, if they're in the school at the time, will come running uh, to help them out. That's a very bizarre and strange behavior, which has almost been normalized now. At any rate, the key here is that, strictly speaking, what the choice or scholarship or voucher idea does is that it solves a problem inherent in any government service. Namely, whereas in free markets, all producers and employees must either purchase either please the purchaser, rather, or be disciplined by him. All government employees receive their income, not from the purchaser of the service, but from the state. And thus, only with great difficulty can purchaser consumers of education uh, discipline a government service. The only way any public style service can be transformed into a private style service is by altering the structure of the power relationship between purchaser and seller of the educational product. In other words, when it comes to education, the trick is to change the boss of the teachers and administrators from the state to the parents. You know, when the principal of a public school hears complaints from parents, oh yeah, we'll do something about it, no problem, let me look after it. But often nothing ever happens. But when he hears it from a parents in a voucher school or private school, immediately, because they're going to say, if you don't fix it, we're going to take our kids out this year. Uh, he gets alarmed that this might be a trend. He might lose all his students. So he does something about it. Now, that's effectively a form of power exercised by parents uh, over the administration of the school. Um, again, often when I give public speeches, uh, I'll talk about education. And uh, usually I refer to it, the problems as uh, because people will say something like, um, you know, there's a real problem with education. And I say, uh, there's no problem with private education. It's only with public education. Most of the important private schools in Canada, some of which now, and I lament this, have become, like you said, many universities for the rich, uh, but they're still great schools. Uh, for 150 years, some of them have existed. They managed to turn out the brightest and best young men and women ever, 
with no Ministry of Education, no guidelines from the state, and no public funding, you see. So all we're trying to do here by talking about a voucher system is to convert every public school in the country into a kind of private school by using a voucher system. Um, for, for Chubb and Mo, effective schools give far greater autonomy to school principals. They value academic courses highly. They focus on clear and high level school, personal and academic standards, and they support strong discipline. High teacher professionalism, a high degree of organization, and a lot of parent involvement. James S. Coleman was a U.S. researcher who wrote another landmark work on public versus private education, especially in the U.S. and in Catholic schools, uh, where in contrast to Canada, parents, parents pay the school directly. In Canada, you can direct your taxes to a Catholic school, but it's not like you pay the Catholic school directly. Anyway, Coleman found that the extra effect of attending a Catholic school is about one year's extra achievement over a two-year period. Dropout rates are much lower, and Black and Hispanic students in Catholic schools are three times as likely to graduate as their counterparts in public schools. Some 83% of kids in Catholic schools go to college, compared with 53% uh, from public schools. These are kind of astonishing numbers. It's not like one or two percent. Uh, and the, the fact is, Coleman tells us, because of the way they're structured, that these schools were all seen uh, seen by everyone as agents of the parents and not agents of the government or of society. Uh, and their students were performing better on every measure. One of the interesting reasons Catholic schools produce better students is because, listen to this, because they actually lack money and resources. They, they can't hire more teachers and trot out, you know, 50 different courses and a whole bunch of basket weaving topics that are actually unimportant and graduate students who can't think, read, write, or do arithmetic. Uh, so in a sense, the poverty of the Catholic school has forced them to confine themselves to uh, really educational uh, products. For example, um, they, he, Coleman says, these schools have not succumbed to the, quote, shopping mall, unquote, or cafeteria education syndrome, whereby students are self-selecting courses from among, get this in some Ontario schools, 265 electives. He says that uh, good schools maintain a high level of social capital and functional community that tends to glue the students together with teachers, parents, and community. All of these schools are distinguished by a set of beliefs of high standard arising from religious tenets or tradition and from parental involvement, but usually from both. Now, there are objections to this, of course, and we hear them from teachers' unions all the time. <laughs> so let's hear them. Teachers' unions in the U.S. and Canada aggressively resist the idea of choice in education or the notion of any voucher type program <clears throat> on the grounds that the egalitarian ideal of a common education for all would be lost, that the rich and poor would segregate, leaving the poor to the worst, <clears throat> the worst of the teachers and schools, that money would go to religious based schools that indoctrinate students with religion, they meant, that private schools receiving public money would not be accountable to taxpayers, and that control over curriculum would be lost. Now, the, all these objections are answerable, um, although much of the argument for the public school in the first place is that it could better educate the poor. It has miserably failed the poor. <laughs> One example will suffice. In Ontario, the province I live in, Canada's wealthiest province, although it's now declining, or at the time I wrote the book, it was declining under an openly socialist government. Uh, today, it's got a more conservative government. But it had a dropout rate for its basic level students who were overwhelmingly from low-income families of 80%. So 80% of those kids 
were simply dropping out of education. Now, this message is not lost in the poor themselves. About 22 U.S. states or more today have choice programs of one sort or another. The well-known conservative sociologist Charles Murray argues in his compassionate and challenging study of the poor called Losing Ground that the egalitarian public school environment, always reluctant to discipline, to reward, or to promote excellence over others, ends up extracting a transfer of sorts from the better of any two students to the worst, simply through its concentration on all equally. In other words, one economically poor or disadvantaged student is compelled to surrender a part of his own education, so an equally poor and disadvantaged but more poorly behaved student can stay in the classroom. The poor, especially the excellence-oriented Black and Hispanic poor, are aware of the bondage they suffer through the educational bureaucracy. They know that they are the ultimate victims of a public education system that systematically downgrades its standards to please its captive failures, not necessarily by design, but by the nature of the philosophy and the structure of any public system. So really what's needed here, and this comes from Polly Williams, the black parent in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, who really in, in the, back in the day was leading the charge for a voucher system for the poor. Now she calls this program parental empowerment. And that's what I've been talking about. And it's a good phrase. And she won. On September 4th, 1990, thousands of poor inner city kids, each with a voucher worth $2,500, marched into the schools of their choice, not schools the government was forcing them to attend. Many of them were created spontaneously to cater to the new market for vouchers. This, she says, is, a, is telling the public schools that if you want to keep the students, fine, just educate them. If you can't educate them, let's get as many hostages out of there as possible. <laughs> it was published in the Wall Street Journal in September of 1990. Liberals, she complains, never ask what poor people want. They have managed to create a system that rewards failure and not success, and the fitful efforts at reform have benefited the middle classes and not the poor. You know, there's no gang problem in private schools, and there's only a 2% dropout rate. And what's been happening with the voucher system is that there's been many, essentially, private schools uh, created uh, by, the, by paying vouchers and even creating new schools uh, wherever possible. Mrs. Williams is, was challenging an entrenched establishment, establishment uh, whose livelihood depends on continuing certain programs, uh, regardless of their effectiveness. Remember, however, that even a choice system run with vouchers or scholarships is still a form of socialism because it relies upon forcibly extracted tax dollars. It is not true free choice, as when you pay freely pay tuition at a private or religious school, which is the ultimate goal of a free society's education system, to free the schools entirely from the state. And I'll talk in a moment how that's been done in Holland over the last 100 years. At least a voucher system would be a great step forward. So now I want to talk about, uh, I talked already about students carrying knives and guns to public schools. Uh, again, when's the last time anyone read a story in the press about students carrying knives and guns to religious schools? It hardly ever happens. Now, the Dutch, this really fascinated me when I first researched it, have had true choice since 1917. Before that, the government was running the schools. Now, most government school systems started in the late 19th century. And, and a question anyone would want to ask is, why, after literally thousands of years of parents either educating their own kids or hiring uh, tutors to live in their homes and educate the kids or visit their homes every day, 
or creating small private schools in the neighborhood where they could send their kids, which had nothing to do with government. Why all of a sudden, when these societies were beginning to get wealthier, well, we can kind of see, I gave it away right there, uh, did they start leaning on government and asking the government to do what parents for thousands of years always felt it was their sole responsibility and something over which they dearly wanted control. Why did they release millions of children to government workers, unionized government workers for that matter, and say you have now trapped the kids in this failing system? By the way, I'm not saying there are no good public schools. There are, and we know where they are and how good or bad they are. And they tend to be in more wealthy parts of the cities of the world. Um, again, I'm not saying there are no good public schools or no devoted and dedicated public teachers. There are. But if you look at the whole darn system as a whole, you come up with the kind of numbers I've been talking about. But the Dutch decided to get away from government in 1917. Uh, in 1880, as I say, more than 70%, 77% actually, of the Netherlands pupils attended public schools. But today, almost 80%, depending on the grade level, attend private schools with, guess what, with a Dutch design voucher system. Article 23, you can look it up, of the Dutch Constitution ensures that any responsible citizen group may start a school and receive public funding without discrimination. Today, tiny Holland has more than 6,300 of what they call competent education authorities or autonomous school units. Some critics have complained that Article 23, designed to prevent discrimination against religions, in fact allows white flight from government schools that are filling with non-Dutch immigrants and all that kind of thing, amounting to a kind of government uh, finance segregation. Uh, but there are responses to that and the first is to look at the United States, where black parents are far more worried about education than they are about segregation. Second, most public schools uh, in the U.S. and in Canada are inherently seg segregated by virtue of their neighborhoods. It is still far better for the parents to have choice and control than little prevents a minority child from changing schools or minority parents from changing neighborhoods schools or simply creating new and better schools. In the best example that Chubb and Mo gave, it is poor, listen to this, poor drug infested East Harlem in New York, which after installing a voucher type choice system in only a few years, upgraded its students from last in almost every educational skill to a middle ranking among all New York schools. New and innovative parent-controlled schools began to spring up like blossoms from the tired nooks and crannies of long-forgotten buildings. Chicago, which has a special problem of this kind with the poor, has now has more than 50 such private schools, voucher maintained, that mainly serve those of low income, many of them costing students less than $1,000 a year. According to the Wall Street Journal reports on the Chicago experiment and Chubb and Moe and the Harlem one, the students are far happier and far more successful. The long and short of this is that it is possible for whole districts, whole regions, even for whole nations, as in the case of Holland, to cast off the shackles of socialism and education. And so I say, let's do it. Here are a few steps in how you would do it. Any nation wishing to liberate its young from the clutches of educational socialism must design a plan and do battle for the right to install choice in education. I think using that word, which is a word leaned on by the left in everything they want to gain from government and from society, we should take a page from their book and use the word choice uh, to demand educational rights uh, with a voucher system for our children. The argument that the state must have some role in excess of the ordinary laws of the land uh, loses force utterly when we pause to think, as I say, for more than two centuries, Canadian and U.S. private schools have never required a Ministry of Education. 
to create the most demanding curricula and the finest, most well-rounded students. If we continue to be educational losers and resist the challenge to take back the schools, then this nation, I'm speaking of Canada, desperately requires some sort of standardized testing st system to smoke out the incompetence and obfuscation of bad school teachers and institutions. After all, very few citizens would freely surrender would freely surrender the tax money they now do to a private school that had a 33% dropout rate. So why then are they compelled to give it to public schools that perform that badly? In a 1985 Gallup poll, and you remember a few lectures back, I talked about how the opinion of citizens in my country expressed on repetitive Gallup polls that keep asking the same question decades after decades. And so they have a huge inventory of reliable responses. In a 1985 Gallup poll, fully 94% of the citizens supported the idea of standardized testing. Uh, yet only 15% of the educational experts um, backed the idea. And um, so they got their way, no standardized testing. Thus do the elites of the top-down state control the people and their resources. Um, as in any other market system, however, choice in education will automatically produce mostly good schools, just as a public education system, a government schools, produces mostly bad ones. As I say, not all, but mostly. The proof is in the pudding. And by the way, it's very difficult to get the kind of numbers I'm going to cite right now. Most private schools in Canada graduate 95% of their students and send a very large percentage to universities of their choice. When I was researching this book, I wanted to know what the situation was in the province of British Columbia, which I heard had terrible dropout rates from uh, government schools. So I called the Ministry of Education and I asked them, how many kids graduate from public schools, how many drop out, and how many go on to university compared to private schools in your province? And you know what they said? We can't give you that information. They basically denied me, a tax-paying citizen who's funding their damn operation, denied me the information for my, uh, my paper. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. So not only are they locking up the system, they're locking up the information because they don't want to be embarrassed by their own institution. So other things that, that may be done, um, whether in private or in public schools, Canadians, I'd say all citizens, must devise a means to prevent ideologically minded teachers, however well intentioned, from imposing their views on students. Now, we happen to be living in a time at which aggressive Woke ideology is everywhere, especially in the schools. If you want to see a perfect example of a narrow-minded student uh, coming out of an institution, just go to almost Canadian, any Canadian university and talk to them, and you'll, you'll see the degree of intolerance is absolutely incredible on almost any even slightly controversial topic. I know I've done it. I often get invited to talk to university classes. Well, not much anymore because they know who I am. But I remember when I went to a university an hour away from me, speaking to a fourth year class in sociology about the importance of the family, about this book, actually. And at the end of the hour, uh, some of the kids ran off to other classes. They didn't want to be late. But at least half the students came swarming up to the front and said, Mr. Garner, we've never, ever heard this kind of discussion or these kinds of argument, or heard these kind of facts before. In four years here, I'm an honor student. I've never heard this. It's astonishing. I said, what? He said, well, that we'd never heard it. How come? Well, then they had to run to class, and I didn't have time to explain what I'm explaining to people listening here. But I, I found it just devastating. And, and yet, uh, my experience has been that if you try to engage, not everybody, but if you try to engage a lot of these students in um, discussion of controversial subjects, like say global warming or um, the so-called abortion right or gay marriage or any of these things 
which are still controversial with millions of people around the world, let alone in my country, all you're going to get is the standard uh, story. You know, global warming is real. You know, it's something to be terrified of. The world is going to end in 12 years, all that kind of thing. Uh, why? Because of carbon dioxide. If you tell them that we know from great scientific studies from geology and climatology that there were many periods in Earth, Earth history which were interglacial periods, which is like what we're in now. Uh, out of the nine or ten glacial periods uh, that affected Canada, there were many periods where there was far more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and they were very cold. Uh, there, there was no global warming. And there are also many studies, I tell the students, which indicate that um, the rise in carbon dioxide often follows the warming trend. It doesn't precede it and create it. Uh, well, they'll just go, they'll just look at you like you're stupid or they'll walk away. But the point I'm trying to make is they are not equipped to debate. They are not given uh, the confirmation on all sides of the issue. Same, same with abortion. If you say to a kid, well, it's basically murder. You're murdering a human being in the womb. Uh, yeah, but it's my body, my choice, that kind of thing. Well, even our own former prime minister, Pierre Trudeau, answered a feminist when he said, the flaw in the argument is we're not talking about your body. We're talking about someone else's body. Now, if you say that to a young student, most of them in today's universities here anyway, you'll just get a blank stare or anger or, or they'll shout at you. Well, most of all, they don't know what to say. And I think that's a an execrable comment on the kind of education they've been receiving, not only in high school, but for four years in university. Anyway, um, I think what many countries require is a kind of pupil's rights law. That would be equivalent to the American so-called Hatch Amendment. It spells out the limits of teacher invasion of personal, family, and student psychological life. They, we could also use a parental consent or opting in provision requiring any teacher who wishes to teach any course that counsels students psychologically or requires a student to give private, personal, or family information to have signed parental permission from all the students attending the class. That would stop it in its tracks pretty quickly, at least segregate it. When it comes to an explosive subject area such as sex ed, and we did a lecture on that a little while back, family authority must be honored by the schools. The way to arrange this for any sensitive subject area is for the schools to offer courses, not to the children, but to the parents who may in fact want help in communicating things like sex ed to their children. Uh, to their offspring. Uh, that would soon put a limit on uh, on freewheeling uh, sex ed teachers, uh, uh, putting stuff into the minds of children, which is way beyond uh, uh, their age level and out of out of out of sync with the moral fabric of their society. Here's another thing which any country should develop: a minimum comp competence movement for public schools. As I say, you don't need them at private schools. It's built in. So a minimum competence movement at the pre and post secondary level, um, and they have that in the US by the way, but Canada doesn't, that no student, this, listen to how, how weak this is, that no student be given a high school diploma without first passing uh, a test showing that he or she could read everyday English and do simple arithmetic. Believe it or not, such a requirement has already had an enormous salutary effect on U.S. education. And then uh, another idea is that there should be a public education contract if you're going to keep public schools to spell out what students are going to get for their money. For example, the right to privacy, to be taught to read and write English by a reasonable age, to be free of any teaching critical of private religious beliefs or that attempts to undermine those beliefs, to be free of situational value instruction and psychological ethics games, and to receive instruction in basic skills and knowledge. 
The second thing to go along with this idea of an educational contract for students would be a charter of students' responsibilities. It's amazing, actually, in our age, how often you see documents like Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which doesn't have the word responsibility or the word obligation anywhere in it. It's all about rights, and the rights are broadcast in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms as some kind of um, indwelling a spiritual reality of each person which they can call upon whenever they want something badly enough, uh, always forgetting, as they do, that Article 1 of our Charter basically allows the courts to dismiss any of those rights which it thinks are justifiable in a free and democratic society. That's a quote. And so what it's, the people thinks it means everything and gives them something in the nature of, I don't know what it is they want. Uh, in fact, the courts can withdraw those rights or modify them uh, almost any way they want. Here's an interesting one, is that the best way to learn is to teach. I know that. I was a teacher, and no one learns more than the teacher when he's teaching a subject to students. That's because you have to get around the topic in so many ways to make it understandable that you yourself get insight. So many countries could develop a simple tutorial system in which older students must spend a portion of each day or week teaching younger students something. There's a huge difference, after all, between recognizing information <clears throat> and producing it. Such a student tutorial program would enliven the students, likely reduce the cost, and improve understanding for all. Um, there are other things which need to be done, for example, getting rid of tenure. Principals must have the unfettered right to hire and fire teachers and, and parents the right to hire and fire principals rather than waiting for the government to do it. Here's an interesting one. In West Virginia became the first jurisdiction in North America to revoke or deny a driving license to youngsters who do not show satisfactory progress towards their high school graduation. There are exceptions for hardship cases where, you know, the student's living alone with his grandmother or something and she can't drive, so they make those exceptions. <laughs> and the law has no effect after a student reaches 18. Uh, but until then, and by the way, Wisconsin followed suit here, this is called a no pass, no drive law. If you can't pass, you can't drive. It has already cut truancy and dropout rates remarkably. Attendance rates are now above 98% in sub -dis some districts that have this no pass, no drive program. And 25% of those dropouts who lost their licenses are back in school. Many more states have considered this rather ingenious uh, plan since then. Uh, there's also the idea here in reformation of the schools that all public schools should require mandatory physical education for at least an hour every day of sufficient intensity to create a training and health protection effect for the nation's youth. You don't want kids going to your schools for eight years and coming out less fit than when they went in. That's why I call it a training effect. Training effect is measurable. The kid can't do a chin up when he starts. By the time he graduates, he can do 10 of them, whatever. So you can easily monitor the progress of students from a physical uh, fitness and sports point of view. Another idea is that public schools should require basic inexpensive uniforms or at the least a very simple enforced uh, dress code. I can't tell you how many public school teachers I meet who lament the fact that the girls are walking around the hallways with their cheeks, cheeks of their bums hanging out of their pants, and the guys have their jeans uh, you know, just sort of hanging onto the pubic bone. <laughs> we can see the crease in their fannies when they walk down the hall and uh, holes in their jeans and in their shirts, a hundred things like that, where in a sense, what they're wearing creates disrespect for the whole idea of wearing anything. Uh, never mind the style competition, which is usually uh, seen in schools uh, among the girls. So a simple uniform would solve that. I lived in Japan for six months, and everywhere I went, there was a simple black tunic worn by the girls 
and a simple jacket and shirt and pair of pants worn by the boys in every school in Japan. And they did that because they did not want uh, the poor to feel embarrassed by the ritzy clothing of the rich. And I think that's an admirable, an admirable uh, objective. Uh, as I say, as things stand, one of the most, I'm sorry for this paragraph, but I guess I was riled up. As things stand, one of the most depressing sights possible is a gaggle of overweight public school teenagers walking down the street at recess, smoking or stuffing dripping pizza in their mouths from the local plaza and sporting shredded blue jeans full of holes or revealing short shorts, dirty fingernails, greasy hair of the works. That's the kind of uniform too. And it's the best indicator, I say, of future behavior is past behavior. So, you know, let's get on with changing it. I'm about to stop now, but I do want to draw your attention to an unbelievable article published in um, Time magazine, which basically under, underlined, uh, just by publishing this uh, chart with a brief article, underlined everything I've been saying about the difference between government schools and, um, in this case, Catholic schools, which are private. So this article was published in Time magazine, and uh, they compared public schools to Catholic schools in terms of uh, teacher-student ratios, percentage who graduate on time per different schools, and so on. Here we go. In the public schools studied in New York City by this uh, study, there were almost a million uh, students. In the Catholic schools studied, there were 110,000 students. These were not cherry picked. They just went into the schools and said, we want to know what's going on. The student teacher ratio in these public high schools was uh, 30, uh, excuse me, uh, 30 to one. And the Catholic uh, student teacher ratio uh, was 18 to one. So in the Catholic school, the assumption is the students got more and better attention because uh, there were half as many of them, just about half as many of them uh, per teacher. I would also qualify that by saying that I think uh, student teacher ratios are not that important if you have a civilized and well behaved society of children. Uh, I know in South Korea and Japan, for example, when I wrote this chapter, you often had classrooms with 40 or even 50 students to one teacher because, you know, they weren't throwing spitballs, uh, using the F F-bomb word with each other out loud in the classroom or dissing the teacher or threatening to hit him. You know, there was none of that. They were just well-behaved kids doing what they were told and learning a lot. And when I was a public school student, this is a long time ago now, you know, 70 years ago or more, 75 years ago, because I'm almost 82. So 75 years ago, I have a picture of myself in public school, like, you know, grade three or whatever, primary school, whatever you call it. And um, there must have been 45 of us uh, in that class. And uh, the teachers would, teachers would take turn, turns teaching us according to what they were teaching. But there was not a huge discipline problem uh, in that school. So here's another factor of this Time Magazine article, which is astonishing. The percentage who graduate from these schools on time, 38% graduated from the public schools on time, you know, without doing extra years or extra months or whatever it is they had to do to catch up. 18, 18%, excuse me, 99% of the Catholic school students graduated on time as planned. So 38% compared to 99%. The percentage who were in, this is the phrase special education. Special education means, you know, for kids who can't make it uh, in the ordinary classroom, they go to a special education or whatever. Twelve percent of the public school students were in special education classes and 0.1 percent in the Catholic schools. The spending per student in U.S. dollars at the time, this is 1991, was $7,100 per student. And in the Catholic schools, it was 1735 all quoted in Time magazine. They do their fact checking. The average teacher's pay at the time in the public schools was just over 39,000 in U.S. dollars in the public schools. 
In the Catholic schools, it was 22,550. Here's another shocker. The administrators at head office of the whole public school system, 3,930 administrators in the public school system, 33 administrators in the Catholic school system. Of course, they're talking about a tenth of the students <laughs> that they dealt with, but that number is way out of whack. Uh, anyway, here's another one. The ratio of administrators to students was four to 1,000 students in the public system. And in the Catholic system, the number of administrators to students was three to 11,000. So anyway, this, <laughs> this gives you a kind of overview and a sense of the difference uh, between government schools and private schools. And just to sum up again, my message would be, let's take back the schools. We gave our children to the government. We can take them back from the government but we have to be prepared to do the work involved, prepared to agitate and lobby for something like a voucher system um, to free them from the clutches of the government. Uh, and I think until we do that, the story will just be on repeat and probably getting worse over time uh, because you can't help noticing that in the Western democracies, there's been a kind of dumbing down of education, not only in the lower schools and high schools, but also in the universities. You know, uh, you know, when I was a university teacher, I remember at Stanford, I gave, at, at Stanford, almost every kid who gets in is a straight A student from high school. So I was teaching a course there and this very nice kid came up to me. I gave him a C plus for his paper. And he was just so distraught, you could hardly believe it. He walks up to me, asks for an appointment, he comes to my office, Mr. Gardner said, I've never had less than an A in four years of high school. So I looked at him, I said, well, this is not high school. <laughs> what stopped him for a moment? And I said, listen, sometimes teachers can make mistakes. Okay, but that can go in either direction. If you want me to reevaluate your paper, I just want to warn you that your grade may go down or it may go up. I'm not sure until I look at it a second time. So, you know, you're going to take your chances. And he left with this paper. He didn't ask me to reevaluate it. You know why? Because by instinct and intuition, he knew that it was only a C-plus paper. It wasn't his best work. He was just going for a better grade if he could get it. So more power to you, right? But it didn't work on that occasion. Anyway, I want to thank you all for listening. Um, I'm going to wrap up these, this lecture series for now. Maybe we'll come back in the, in the future. There are a bunch of very difficult chapters still to go in the war against the family chapter on radical feminism, a chapter on the homosexual movement, a chapter on the abortion movement uh, in the world and all that kind of stuff. And right now I just don't have the, the bandwidth to start studying it again and getting myself all upset and riled up. Uh, so one, I want to say thank you to you, Pickley, and, and to Harry, who were so kind to have me on board. And maybe we can teach and keep in touch. And if uh, things change, I will uh, I will contact you. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Um, and thank you so much for the everything that you've contributed. Um, I don't know how many um, weeks it's been in terms of how many lectures, but we've certainly got our money's worth out of you and we weren't even paying you. So <laughs> um, thanks very much. Uh, we really appreciate yeah. you. Thank you very um, much. And sorry. Um, before you, you, you all take small. care. Um, well, I was just going to quickly say, do you have time for No, Nobody's got their hand up at the minute, but if there is a question, um, do you have time for one? <laughs> so let's put the hand up straight away there. Um, if you don't, that's absolutely fine. But um, I just thought I'd give that opportunity for you and for them, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't put you on the spot either. So so we're done for today, Pickley? Oh, gosh, sorry, it muted me. You take care. Thanks so much once again. I'll end the recording you now. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.